This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org forward slash donate. For as little as $10 a month, you can help people find life-changing guidance. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, this is the third majlis, the third gathering for the readings of the heart softeners from Mishkat al-Musabih by Imam al-Tabrizi, a compilation of hadiths from different babs, from different uh, collections of hadiths such as Bukhari, Muslim, the four Sunan and other rare collections. And in the next set of uh, hadith, we're going to read number six, we're number, sorry, number 11 to number 16. And we're going to finish the Fasl al-Awwal, the first section which contains the most authentic hadiths from Bukhari and Muslim from uh, Imam Tabrizi's Mishkat. So he begins, Bismillah, by, say, by saying, وَعَنْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بِنْ عَمَرْ رَضِ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ قَالْ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَرُزِقَ كِفَافًا وَقَنَّعَهُ اللَّهُ بِمَا آتَاهُ رَوْهُ مُسْلِمْ that uh, on the authority of Abdullah bin Amr, uh, Imam Muslim narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, successful is the one who embraced Islam. Or what does that mean? It means the one who has directed his life towards Allah, who has submitted towards the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taken Allah as his Lord. The one who, who embraces Islam and who is blessed with just enough in his provision for every day and who was made content with that by Allah. So in this hadith, there are three things that the Prophet ﷺ talks about in terms of success. And what do we mean by success? It means that person, aflaha falah, that person has attained the goal. What is the goal? By reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his good pleasure and attaining Jannah after that. Um, so this, the one who is successful is the one who has accepted, embraced Islam. What does this mean? It doesn't necessarily mean the one who converts. In our time and in every time, even a person who's born into a Muslim family, at some point in time, they have to consciously make a decision to follow Islam. Maybe you've been raised up in a Muslim home or maybe you converted, but at some point in time, every Muslim has to make a conscious decision to look at the world around them, understand how things work, and then say, I want to follow the way that Allah wants me to follow. And this is the one who is uh, successful. Right? That's one. The second thing, the second uh, uh, ingredient to that success is that that person has been given just enough by Allah. So rizq is something that comes from Allah. It is sustenance or provision that comes regularly. It, Allah sends it regularly. It's not just food. It could be drink. It could be your money. It could be the breath that you take, the health that you have. Every single thing that you get from Allah to sustain yourself is called rizq. And so that person is given enough. And when we talk about kifaf, it's just enough. It means that, that they don't have anything beyond their needs. Now, it's not just the person who gets enough alone, because there are people who get not there, there are people who don't have enough. But it's rather that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes him content or her content with what he has bestowed upon them. So what does that mean as well? Contentment at the end of the day, right? Uh is is the idea of contentment is not something that we ourselves can decide to have. As much as we say, you know, be content. At the end of the day, it is something that Allah creates in the heart of the servants. Uh, whom he has chosen. And this is why we realize that contentment itself is such a gift. A lot of people say in our time, you know, if I just had one more car, or if I just had this degree, if I just could marry this kind of person, get this promotion, buy this house, make my house, the, my dream house, I would be happy. And at the end of the day, this is not true. This is not, and then they get that and they're not content with that either. Because they've put contentment in the wrong place. Rather, if they see what Allah has given them, and they thank Allah for it, then they become content. And you know the interesting thing is, when one becomes content, one continues to thank Allah, and one's blessings increase. And it may not be the actual physical amount of wealth. So they're given just enough, because you say, oh, I don't want just enough, I want a lot. Well, that's gonna be very difficult to be content with. But if a person is given just enough, it doesn't necessarily mean that when they thank Allah for it, that they get, you know, their, their, their wealth expands by becoming rich. But that barakah of that wealth, the blessedness of that wealth, means that they can do more without tiring themselves out and get a better outcome from that. And mainly, the increase is also that the happiness and the peace that they feel inside their hearts increases them in shukr for Allah and worship for Allah. And this is the ingredients of a successful person. The next hadith, وَأَنْ أَبِي هُرَيَّةَ رَضِي اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ قَالْ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَقُولُ الْعَبْدُ مَالِي مَالِي وَإِنَّ مَا لَهُ مِنْ مَالِهِ ثَلَاثَةً مَا أَكَلَ فَأَفْنَى أَوْ لَبِسَ فَأَبْلَى 
أو أعطى فاقتنى وما سوى ذلك فهو ذاهب وتاركه للناس رواه مسلم In the hadith uh, uh, that is narrated by Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه and uh, in the collection of Imam Muslim uh, the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم peace be upon him said the servant i.e. the human being claims he cries out my wealth my wealth he says my wealth my wealth but yet the only true thing that he truly owns from, this, from his wealth are three things. That which he consumed and so finished it, meaning ate and drank, so he finished it. And that which he dressed in and wore it out. And that which he gave away for the sake of God, so actually, uh, uh, and he actually saves it up for the next life. So that which one gives away is actually what one saves back, right? And as for other than that, other than the things that, that he or she consumes and wears directly that they need and that they give away, other than that, then, then he is soon departing and he would leave it behind for other people, right? Imam Muslim narrates that. So at the end of the day, we understand something. That at the, at the Prophet ﷺ begins the hadith saying, the slave, the, the servant of Allah. At the, at the end of the day, the person is, uh, practically speaking, they're a servant to their wealth. But in reality, they're a servant to Allah. They do ultimately what Allah uh, commands that they that will happen to them and they say my wealth my wealth they ascribe it to me this is my house this is my car how, how dare you do that on my property so they keep thinking that they have this ownership and pride in their wealth and then the Prophet is saying actually you don't really ha your wealth is not really yours why because unless you spent it and consumed it and enjoyed it or you gave it away then you're gonna die and we're all gonna die soon and everything that we have that was just saved up in the bank is just going to go to our inheritors. In other words, we're not going to touch it, we're not going to get any piece of it. So in one sense, we're just saving it up for other people. So what does this mean? Eat what you need to eat and drink the way that you need to drink. So provide for yourself and your family with enough that you're able to carry out your needs and be responsible and be healthy. Right? No one is saying that you have to uh, drip feed yourself and, and uh, be starving. But you take what you have and the clothes that you wear. No one is saying to dress in a burlap sack if you have the ability to dress in finer clothing, better clothing. So you dress and you have the different needs, your vehicle, whatever you have, your technology for what you need, right? And that which you save up, just remember, it's not yours because you're not going to have the ability to enjoy it. And even when you do enjoy it, if you enjoy it in the halal, you're blessed for it. If you enjoy it in the haram or in wastefulness, you're going to be called to account for it. So this is why giving that away, if you really want to save your wealth, and make sure that it benefits you. If you have a million dollars in the bank, then when you spend it on good works, charity, philanthropy, um, spending it in such a way uh, for education, for other things that are for a good intention, then you've actually used your wealth for a beneficial purpose and you'll see it in the hereafter. Uh, the next hadith is an Anas in Abdullah who who called the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, 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 both Bukhari and Muslim narrate that from Anas عنه, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said three things follow a dead person up to the grave, but two of them return back and only one of them uh, only one of them remains with him. Right? What are those three things? Number one, his family, his wealth. And number three, his actions or her actions. Their family, wealth, and actions follow them. But the family and the wealth turns back from the grave after they bury the deceased and their actions remain. And the whole point of that is that, what do we mean by the family? Everybody, you know, you know, you will think that these are the things that you have. I've got my family, I've got my wealth, the things that I own, my stuff, the things that everyone knows are mine. And in the end, I have what I've done, right? In the end of the day, what I've done for and against myself. The family will only take you up to your grave. You can have the best relationship with your spouse. You can have the most pious children, the best friends. When we mean family, it's not just it's family and friends and coworkers and admirers and people who are you know who've liked you on Facebook and added you on Instagram and stuff like that. You know, they all follow you to the grave, and at the end they mourn for you. They say a fatiha and they come back, and that's it. The the wealth that you have follows you to the grave. How? Because your your uh, shrouding and your burial expenses are perhaps taken out of your estate. So in one sense, that is your wealth. Um, you can say, you know, you you do say this was the car that was owned by the deceased. This was his house. This was, you know, everyone's gathering at the house of the deceased. And then after uh, after the person is buried, it's no longer their house anymore. 
It's the, the house of their son or daughter or their wife. It becomes their, to their inheritance. So that now the wealth that they have turns back. Even the richest person, you can't take their millions and billions and put it inside the grave with them. And even if you did, it would do them nothing, right? In fact, that would be pretty scary to do um, because they would have to account for that. And the only thing that remains with them are their deeds. So let us look as we're going through life. Many times as we get older, uh, people have the tendency uh, to think, what have I left behind for my children? And I've, I heard someone saying, you know, they were, they were upset and they were down. They were saying, I haven't left any land for my children. This person left land for their children. This person left this. And I haven't left anything, any land for my sons. What am I going to say? You know, and at the end of the day, uh, that wouldn't be the beneficial thing, right? If they had it, alhamdulillah, that's good. You leave it. And, and it's good to leave something with your inheritance. But at the end of the day, spending time to earn something, to send back or to say, you know, this is what I left behind or this is what I built before my death, doesn't actually make any sense. Rather, it's the deeds that will come back. And the deeds do follow a person to the grave. How? Because when that person is being put in the grave, people say, oh, he, th she was such and such. Oh, he was such a good person. Oh, she, or maybe they're even mum mumbling or muttering amongst each other. She was like this. He was like that. And speaking bad about them. So your grave, your, your deeds do follow you up to the grave in the tongues of people and the hearts of people. But most of all, in the recording of the angels and in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next hadith is, an Abd Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, uh, uh, an ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ayyukum malu warithi ahabu ilayhi min malihi Qalu ya Rasulullah Ma minna ahadun illa maluhu ahabu ilayhi min mali warithihi Qala fa inna maluhu ma qaddam Wa ma warith wa ma warithahu Wa malu warithihi ma akhar Rawahu al-Bukhari So Allah and this is narrated in a collection of Imam Bukhari And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once asked his companions Which of you loves the wealth of his inheritor more than he loves his own wealth. And they all answered, O Messenger of Allah, there isn't any one of us but that his own wealth is more beloved to him than the wealth of his inheritor. What does that mean? Like, you know, the, the, you, you like your house and your car more than the car and the house of your brother or your son or your wife, you know? And the Prophet ﷺ replied, then certainly his own wealth is only what he sent forward to the next life. And the wealth of his inheritor is whatever he kept back, right? And so what does this mean here? That at the end of the day, what, uh, uh, same, the same concept Imam Tabriz is bringing to soften our hearts that what you what, what you spent for the sake of the next life for the sake of Allah is what you're actually sending forward it's what you saved and what you just kept back and did nothing with that is what you are leaving behind for your inheritors and it counts nothing for you so in other words you had this huge resource you had however much money you had and you could not get the tawfiq, the ability from Allah to be able to use it for your advantage. Whereas if you knew that, for example, a person is sick and they had a billion dollars, they would use the entire billion to heal themselves. They would use everything. Why? Because they think it's helping them. But they don't realize that we might have money and not realize that we can be helping us for the next life eternally. And the next hadith after that is, uh, oh, and the other interesting thing that uh, uh, I'll bring a hadith. There's a hadith from the next chapter that I'll bring in now because it, it uh, uh, pertains to us. Anhu Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu qal bad yablugu bihi qal idha mat al mayitu qalat al malaika ma qaddam wa qalu banu adam ma khallaf rahul bayhaki fi shu'ab al iman. So uh, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu uh, has a narration that he says that he uh, ascribed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it's at the status of a hadith that it is uh, narrated that the uh, when a person passes away, when a person dies, the angels ask, what did they send forward? And yet the people ask, Banu Adam asks, what did they leave behind? So what does this uh, narration tell us? Something very important. The mentality of the angels that represent Allah, what, their thing is always in the hereafter. It's the eternal realm. They're always saying, what did this person send forward when they die? And the people are all wondering, maybe at the funeral, how much did they leave behind? How much, was, how much was their net worth? What, what, do, what does their wife and child have to carry on in this life? As if they are the ones who are the providers for their um, uh, uh, widow and their children. So this is the mentality of people. And so we have to, Imam Tabrizi is taking us through something. First of all, we become attached to our wealth and we say, Mali, Mali, my wealth, my wealth. We have to be a little bit lighter with that. We have to hold it in our hands, but not in our hearts. The next thing that we do is that it's the people's mentality about what they left behind that encourages us to increase our wealth and uh, our status and our prestige amongst people. So don't think like how the people think, otherwise that'll leave you to ruin and nothing. Think about, how, think about things how the angels think, which represents how Allah sees the picture. And uh, in the final hadith, 
uh, there's one more narration that is similar to the previous narration where, where uh, the Prophet said that, the, uh, that uh, the servant says, my wealth, my wealth. Right? It, is, it is narrated that one of the Sahaba came and the Prophet ﷺ was reciting Surah At-Takathur Al-Hakum At-Takathur That the worldly piling up distracts you And then he says the hadith that the servant says My wealth, my wealth And he, uh, the only difference between that, this narration and the one before Is that he specifically says what he gave as charity or sadaqah Is what he has actually saved up for the hereafter The final hadith of the chapter uh, of this fossil, the section is وَأَنْ أَبِي هُرَيَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَرَى عَنْهُ قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم ليس الغناء أن كثرت العرض ولكن الغناء غناء النفس And this is a very beautiful hadith to close uh, our lesson with and to close the chapter with The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said Being rich, being wealthy is not having lots of things but rather being rich is the richness of the soul This is narrated by Bukhari and uh, Muslim and uh, the important thing about this is the Prophet is saying, first of all, what is ghina? Ghina, this idea of ghina, we translate it as being rich or wealthy or affluence. This is in the minds of, of people, but the Arabic word actually has an origin. And what that means to be a ghani is to be free of need. And the Arabs called someone who was rich free of need because they didn't have need for anyone else. They could independently provide for themselves. They had their camels, they had their goats, they had their own food, they had their own house. So a ghani person is a person who does not have need. They don't need to ask anyone for anything. Right, and so uh, in, at the end of the day, the Prophet is correcting a, uh, a misconception among the people of his time, saying, "Rina, wealth is not just what you have—a lot of things, a lot of toys, and a lot of a lot of money in the bank. It's about richness of the soul. And what is that richness of the soul? It is that freedom of need for what other people have." It doesn't mean you grow your own vegetables, although that is a type of thing, right? It could mean that, meaning you don't need to ask people. It means when you, when you look at what Allah has given you, you don't feel like you need to go out and ask things from other people or envy them for anything um, or wish that they, you had something that they had. So that's the actual riches, because the person who feels like that, the person who feels that contentment and richness of the soul, they, are, they have everything in the world. They don't feel disturbed at all. And we have to ask ourselves, are the things that we secretly desire that other people have when we look at social media, when we look at our careers, uh, our families, do we want a bigger house, a bigger car, a better spouse, whatever it is, you know, uh, or are we content to have that richness in our soul? Because that person is the most relaxed. At the end of the day, um, when we take away that greed and that lack, this is why there's some beautiful poetry that I want to share that uh, Mullah Ali Al-Qari, who, uh, who, who wrote the Mirqat, which is the uh, commentary of the Mishkat, he mentions some beautiful poetry and we'll close with this, inshallah. He says, Azizun uh, nafsi man lazim al-qana'ah wa lam yakshif li makhluqin qina'ah he says that the person who is mighty in the soul, strong in the soul, is that person who sticks fast to contentment, who stays, who says, I'm going to be content with what I have. And he does not, or he or she, does not reveal their, their veil to mankind, meaning that thing there, the cover that Allah has given, their privacy about what they have and what they don't have, they're content. If they have, alhamdulillah, if they don't have something, they don't go out to people and say, I wish I had this, I wish I had that. They completely cover themselves, uh, their needs, and rely on Allah alone. That person has contentment. So never take your needs to other people. Unless you, are, you need some help and you ask Allah first. So we need to get into this habit, the spiritual masters say. We all need to get into the habit when we ask someone for something that we need, try to turn to Allah first in your heart, then ask that person. And the spiritual masters say that that is a way of keeping in connection with Allah, even though you're asking creation, what you're doing, really doing, is you're asking Allah through the creation, right? Because Allah provides the means. And the next piece of poetry, وَمَنْ يُنْفِقْ سَاعَاتْ فِي جَمْعِ مَالِهِ مَخَافَةَ الْفَقْرِ فَالَّذِي فَعَلَى الْفَقْرُ He says, and that person who spends all of his hours, the, the hours of his life and time in the gathering of wealth, out of fear of poverty, then that thing that he's doing itself is poverty itself. So that person who spends all their whole career, their whole time trying to gather money or prestige or whatever, fearing that they're going to be poor and insignificant, the act that they're doing of going out out of fear, it is a type of poverty. It's a spiritual poverty. And it says to them, I am poor, because that person says, I don't have enough. And this is why we'll finish with the last one, and, and it clarifies. Um, so just to, you know, at the end of the day, when a person feels like they don't, have enough, that's when they become poor, right? And so he says, رَضِينَ قِسْمَةَ الْجَبَّارِ فِينَا The poet says that we are content 
with the apportioning of what Allah, the, the ever overpowering Lord, has decreed for us. He says, we, he said, the poet says, we have knowledge, for us is knowledge of the hereafter of Allah, and for our enemies is wealth. Let them have the wealth. We'll run after the wealth. For verily, wealth will, will go away. It will, it, will, um, it will deteriorate very soon. And knowledge will remain evermore and never go away. It will, be, it will last for us eternally because we take it to the next life. So inshallah, in this, in this chapter, Imam Tabrizi is trying to take us on a journey through identif- breaking our attachment to our wealth, that it's mine. We use it. A person can be very, very wealthy, but he uses it for Allah, and it's not in his heart, it's in his hand. And he uses it for good and just enough. And the rest he spends on other people for Allah. And so we don't see our attachment to our wealth, and we don't uh, think about the way that uh, think about wealth the way that other people think. And now that we realize, at the end of the day, we're going, and it's only our good deeds that we have to take and what we've put forward of our wealth. So inshallah, through this, may Allah subhanahu wa taala soften our hearts. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless you all in this blessed month, inshallah, and join us tomorrow again for the next fasl al fasl al thani, the next section of the heart softeners from the hadith of Mishkat al Masabiyah by Imam al Tabrizi. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa sallam wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Visit seekersguidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit seekersguidance.org forward slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.